Shalom and welcome to Seeking Truth in Torah. This is the Heroin Hallway section and you're with me Alia today. And I just want to say welcome. And I just really pray that this article and this message is just truly going to speak to you. And before we get in to today's message, I just want to say that everything that is presented here is not just about you gaining information it's not about you just gaining knowledge just so you can be empowered with knowledge it's about you hearing the message that Yeshua has on his heart especially in this season in this hour and in this time period and this is what this teaching is actually all about yes you will receive information yes you will receive knowledge but it's more about you experiencing what Yahweh's Ruach is saying to you right now in this time what the Holy Spirit is saying to you through this message and that is what I hope you will receive that you will come with that open heart and that you will receive and if you look at the picture on your screen I absolutely love this picture and at the bottom this girl that's standing in this pink dress has these tackies on or sneakers and she has on two different color socks because she's just so unique and so individual and this is what this teaching is all about so let us just close our eyes and let us just pray Father, we just thank you for your opportunity that you give us to just gather around your word, Father. We just truly pray that you'll just take control, Abba Father, that you would lead and guide every single word, every single message that you want to come out of this teaching today, that, Father, you will strengthen our hearts, that you will strengthen the hearts that are weary, Father. Those, Father, as your word says, even youth, Father, even young people grow weary and faint, Father. But when we wait upon you, you will help us. We will be raised up on wings of eagles, Father, and that truly is my prayer, that we will be raised up in this generation and that the women who are listening to this will be raised up because this message is for them father it is for your female part of your army father and i just truly pray for that today father that you would strengthen our hearts help us know that we are called for more father that each one of us are called for unique plan and purpose and father we just ask that you would take control that you would just lead and guide us in this teaching and we just bless your holy name father and we just thank you yeshua we just pray this in your mighty name Amen. So welcome, as I said already, today's teaching is really, really special and it's called Yeshua's Talmidot. If you want the written article, I wrote this article actually, I think it was about a year ago and it is available on our website called Yeshua's Talmidot. But what I want to say is I'm using information from that article, but other things that Yeshua has laid on my heart during the past two weeks while I was preparing this teaching. So some of the information you can get in that article and I would encourage you to do that but the rest I'm just sharing f with you from my heart that Yeshua has laid on my heart. So what many of you will realize and notice is that if you're familiar with this word tell me dot, many people are not familiar with this word tell me dot because it's the female disciples of Yeshua. Well, many people know that the disciples of Yeshua, they just call them the Talmidim, which means male disciples. With the word Talmidim, it could also be the way that Hebrew works, is you can have 50 female disciples and one male, and it will be Talmidim, because men are preferred in, in the language setup. But here we're referring totally and uniquely to the female disciples of Yeshua. And I want to ask you today, do you consider yourself a disciple of the Most High God? And how would you define disciple? What what would you think of? What image fills your mind when you hear the disciple? I know for many people that spend a large amount of their time in the church and come from that, they will think of disciples as only being the 12 men that followed Yeshua. And I've heard many people, and uh, not so long ago, I had somebody say to me that women can't serve in leadership positions within the body simply because Yeshua only had 12 male disciples. Now, in this teaching, you will come to realize that that is not actually the truth. However, we need to sit and think, was Yeshua setting up an everlasting, eternal model for leadership by only having 12 Jewish men follow him was he actually setting up an eternal leadership order in other words if you have a congregation and you have someone that is leading your congregation and he's not jewish for example is he automatically excluded because yeshua had 12 jewish 
male disciples. No, of course not. It doesn't mean that Yeshua was setting up this eternal model for leadership by having only 12 men. There are a number of reasons why he chose that 12, those 12 particular males to follow him. But you'll also realize that being a disciple, Yeshua had many disciples. And being a disciple means far greater than what we think in our limited mindset. I want to ask you something, just on that note. Do you think that Judas Iscariot, the man that betrayed Yeshua, do you think he was a disciple of Yeshua? Do you think that he was truly a disciple? And then I want to leave you with that thought so that you can think about, was he truly a disciple? So that's what I want to say. What is it that you think about when someone says you're a disciple of Yeshua? And again, do you consider yourself a disciple of Yeshua? If you do, why do you consider yourself a disciple? And or why don't you consider yourself a disciple? When I say the word disciple, what image fills your mind? Do you think of Simon Peter maybe? Maybe you think of Yohanan, John, the one that leaned on Yeshua's breast. Who do you think of? Because in recent years, many scholars and believers have begun to look at Yeshua's disciples through a completely different lens. Women have begun to question themselves and their role in terms of their calling and in terms of their purpose and in terms of the definition of disciple. And it's really, really amazing that we need to think about it. Are we truly disciples? And if we are a woman and we see ourselves like that, what does that mean for us? So let's go and I want to first have a look at the role of the rabbi and disciple. Because in those days, a disciple was called a Talmud. One disciple is a Talmud. That is, a, or in obviously if it's a female, it's Talmudah. A disciple a student, an individual who walks and who lives alongside a rabbi for the purpose of education, morality, character change and service. One who speaks, talks and walks according to the principles set out by his or her rabbi. That's a Talmud or a Talmudah. A true follower of Yeshua is a disciple. You know, there's a difference between being just a follower of Yeshua and being a disciple. There's a beautiful analogy that we can use to explain this. The disciple, one who yokes himself to a rabbi, walks just like the picture you see on your screen, walks so close to his or her rabbi that the dust from their sandals, from the rabbi's sandal, will get on the clothes of the one who was following him. So that, that's why there's a saying that says you walk in the dust of your rabbi. You've got to get dusty. You've got to be so close on him. You've got to be walking so close to him, walking in his footsteps, walking in his footprints that the dust from his sandals is getting sprayed out onto your garments so that you are getting filled with the dust of your rabbi. And that's, that's a beautiful analogy even we see here in this picture. A rabbi is defined as one that's usually rendered as a teacher or a master, an individual who taught students and was well versed in the Torah, was well versed in the Jewish law, and this title only became an official office after the first century AD. So that was our, that was round right about the time when Yeshua was there. There were many different rabbis. We know that in that time when Yeshua was around there was Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Shammai, and they were very prominent rabbis at the time. They they focused very much on the oral and the Jewish traditions. We we're not going to go into all these things today because we're just going to be dealing with a very surface look at the definition of Talmud and Rabbi. And if you want to go into a deeper look at this and Jewish education, you can have a look at that article that I referred to called Yeshua's Talmud. But today's focus, this is not so much the focus as it's about seeing ourselves through the eyes of the female disciples of Yeshua. So we know that a true disciple is one who walks and lives alongside a particular rabbi for the purpose of education, morality, character change and service. That disciple serves that rabbi that he or she has yoked herself to. She speaks, she talks and she walks according to the principles set out by her rabbi. She doesn't or him for that matter, but we're just going to focus on the woman. She doesn't talk, she doesn't walk, she doesn't speak anything other than what her rabbi has said to her, other than what her rabbi has taught her. There's nothing else that crosses her mind other than what her teacher has given her. And we know that Miriam or Mary Magdalene, but we'll get to her just now, she called Yeshua Rabboni. 
when she saw him when he appeared to her after his resurrection she said my teacher my rabbi she was calling him she, he was her rabbi and that's what she called him when she referred to him so that that just shows a little bit of the relationship they had but we'll get into that I want to say this when Yeshua began his public ministry he was immediately recognized as a righteous man and a great teacher or great rabbi the mission or goal of a rabbi and this is important of any rabbi was to become a living example of what it meant to apply God's word to one's life as important as knowledge of scripture was there was one more thing that was more important a rabbi's moral character and this any disciple of a particular rabbi would study the text of the scriptures but not only that would study basically the text of the rabbi's life because from out of the rabbi's life and out of his character you would learn how to live out the Torah even more than acquiring his master's knowledge he wanted to acquire his master's character I cannot emphasize this more and more and more because many times we have met many people in life and and even teaching teaching classes and being with people in that way many times my husband and myself will say to people it's about your character you know you can know the Torah back to front but if your character stinks then you're gonna make a mess of it if you have pride if you're a person that's full of pride if you're a person that maybe has the wound of bitterness in your life and you you become legalistic this is not the kind of character that Yeshua wants us to have every single thing that Yeshua teaches us he modeled for us by the way that he lived his life and that is what the disciples all looked at they looked at his character they looked at what he did what did he do when he wasn't in front of the crowds what did he do when he was on his own just with them because they wanted to acquire his character and you know rabbi had to have an exemplary character yeshua was the son of god he was the messiah he had an amazing character he still has today the disciples would have examined his character so that they could acquire his character and this went for the men and the women who followed him around in those days yeshua's desire was to find those who wished to be transformed into the image of his father those whose hearts were pure in their desire to learn and to understand the same rings true today yeshua is absolutely not interested in our intellectually cold grasp of knowledge which puffs up 1 corinthians 8 verse 1 but our master is interested in how much our hearts desire to be transformed into the image of our rabbi and king this is how Yeshua chose his disciples. He was interested in, in the hearts of people. There is a saying that says, oh, God sees my heart. Many people use that saying to excuse the sin that they have in their, in their lives. But the, the answer to that is yes. Yahweh does see your heart and he knows what's in the heart of man. He knows that if we truly desire to serve him, we will do that. He knows everything. And the truth of the matter is he's not interested... Yes, he's interested in us learning and studying his word, but he's not interested in our intellectually cold grasp of knowledge. He's not interested in how well you know things. He's interested in how much your heart desires to change, and that's what matters to him. And that's what Yeshua looked for when he was on the earth. He looked for the men and the women whose hearts would be changed and transformed to resemble his image to a dying and broken world. It's the same as what he looks for today. He's not interested in those that walk around using his word as a sword to kill other people with and think about that for a moment many people take the word of of god they take the word of yahweh we know it's our sword but many people drive those swords into other people because they themselves have not dealt with their character so they use the word of yahweh to, as a sword and they hurt other people and they break them down and that's not what yahweh wants us to do he wants us to be smart in how we use his word so uh, this is what I want to get to today. Now I've defined to you what a disciple is. It's one that walks and talks and speaks like his or her rabbi. It's one that gets dusty with the rabbi's dust. Walks so close to him that she is able to be his image on this earth. Isn't that amazing? And I want to say this. If you believe that women are excluded from being disciples, I want to say that that is not what the scripture teaches us. Yeshua I, I need to put this very carefully but I want to say Yeshua brought women into his circle you know in those days where he was living women were excluded from the study halls women could not 
be with a rabbi you know women were more deme- in in the household that's where they were men men and women up to a certain age for little little kids were taught the scriptures but from the age of five the men went on and they they went to Beit Talmud and they went to all those places so that they could be brought up in in the education of the oral law and of the Torah but women were taught to be at home and they were taught all these things but yet Yeshua changed that he brought women into his inner circle and I want to say have you ever thought about the woman that surrounded Yeshua in his life at Yeshua's birth we have Elizabeth you know that his mom, Miriam, that was her name, Miriam was a young girl. She fell pregnant when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. Then she went and she lived with her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant at the time, with John, the immerser. And Elizabeth was the first one to prophesy to Miriam about the Messiah that she was carrying in her womb. And we know that when Elizabeth and Miriam met the the John that was inside of Elizabeth, he leapt in her womb because he felt that he was in the presence of the Messiah. Isn't this amazing? So Miriam is, is there, Elizabeth is there, and then when Yeshua is born and they Miriam and Yosef take him up to the temple we have Anna. Anna is a prophetess. The word says that she prophesied as well. She prophesied about Yeshua. She was a very righteous woman who spent all of her time in the temple. She prophesied. So Yeshua's birth. Look at these amazing women that are standing there. Miriam, his mama, his mom that he loved, Elizabeth and Anna. Before Yeshua's death, now we're moving on. Yeshua's death. We have the woman who anointed him. You know, this is amazing. We have Miriam of Bethany who came and she poured out the the nard, it was spike nard that she poured out onto his feet. What a beautiful picture. A woman were there for Yeshua's birth, anointed him for his death because he said, leave her alone. What she is doing has been prepared. This was something that she needed to do for him. This is something that God had prepared for Miriam to fulfill. She anointed Yeshua for his death. At Yeshua's death, I love this. At Yeshua's stake, we know that there's standing Mama Miriam, his mother. Miriam, the mother of James. We have Salome there. We have Miriam of Magdala that's there. Or other Mary of, her name is known as Mary Magdalene, but we're going to get into that. And there are many other women who had followed him from the Galilee. This you can read in Matthew 27, 55 and John 19. Many, it says in the text, many other women who followed him from Galilee. Where were Yeshua's disciples at this point? The only one that remained at the stake was John. John was the only one of the original 12 disciples that stayed at Yeshua's stake. The rest ran away and deserted Yeshua. But who, who else do you have standing at the stake of Yeshua? You have the amazing woman that followed him from the Galilee. And these are the women that we're going to focus on in this teaching. But first we're going to look at the other Yeshua's resurrection. We know at Yeshua's, so Yeshua at the stake, he dies and he gets put into the tomb. He resurrects again. Who do we find first at Yeshua's resurrection? First at the tomb. First there, Miriam of Magdala again. Miriam the mother of James again. Salome again. And the woman who followed him. Isn't that amazing? Yeshua's, just before Yeshua's death, we have Miriam of Bethany that anoints him. Then we have the woman that, they just didn't, they just didn't leave his side. They were true disciples. They were there at the stake. They were there for his resurrection. And guess what? He told his followers, he told his disciples, those who loved him, they said, he said to them, you go and you wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And you can read about that in Acts 1 to 3. In the upper room, the Holy Spirit fell on them and like tongues of fire appeared on their head. Who was there? Many, many disciples. Mama Miriam was there. And many of the other women who followed Yeshua, they were waiting for the promised Holy Spirit and they were faithfully following Yeshua. I want to submit to you that to be a real disciple, to be one that truly follows the Master means that you are there for everything. It means that you are there for every single part of his life. And these women faithfully followed Yeshua. They were there from the beginning and right until the end and beyond the end. They followed him so faithfully. And this is what I want to touch on. This is what this teaching looks at. Luke 8 verses 1 through to 3. It says, Soon afterwards Yeshua went on through towns and villages, preaching and teaching, bringing the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the twelve 
in brackets apostles were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases miriam of magdala from whom seven demons had been expelled and johanna the wife of chusa herod's household manager and shoshana and many others who ministered to and provided for him and them meaning the twelve out of their property and out of their personal belongings isn't this amazing let's just pause because this is the focus of what we're going to look at in the next few slides and then we're going to bring it home we have these women who are following him <laughs> the scriptures say that the 12 were with him and also some of the women who had been cured of evil spirits when Yeshua went on teaching and preaching and bringing the good news through these towns through these villages in the Galilee in Judea who was with him not only the 12 disciples, not only the 12 that he had chosen, but also the woman who had been cured. They were with him. They were with him all the time. They were serving and they were ministering to them from their personal belongings. I just want to say this word minister we looked at in the last teaching. The last teaching I did was called Roaring Pillars of Fire about the woman of Romans 16. This word minister is again that diaconia from where we have the word deaconess from. I told you in Romans 16 verse 1 we were introduced to Phoebe. It said that she was a deaconess of the congregation. And th that word meaning obviously as we know to be a servant or to serve someone or to render public service. So we need to remember that this is what these women did too. They were, they were using what they had to be with Yeshua, to bless the ministry that he had. And that's how it works today you know we have people that minister the word people that minister the word other people often use what they have specifically their money their finances those who are established in business they often and should this is biblical use what they have to serve those who are bringing the word and this is what these women did they were they were ministering to and providing for Yeshua um, out of their property and their personal belongings so they were Basically, you could use the same word, deaconess, diaconia. They were in a close relationship with their rabbi, with the one that they had accepted as the Messiah, and they were ministering to them. These women were truly outstanding because what they did in their day and age was amazing. They followed the Lamb wherever He went. They provided for Him and they received His teachings. And that was how Yeshua wanted to be. He never told them to leave. He never told them to go away. He accepted them because they were faithful disciples. And this is amazing because the truth of the matter is that, as I said earlier on, women didn't follow their rabbis. They didn't go to study halls. They didn't learn. And they, as I said, they didn't follow rabbis around. Obviously, I believe that Yeshua did this in a way that avoided any scandal among the people. Or it wasn't, it wasn't a strange thing today. We have terrible theories about Yeshua being married and all that nonsense. It's, it's lies from the devil. That was not how it was. These men and women knew that he was the Messiah. They accepted him as their rabbi and they followed the lamb wherever he went. And that was so beautiful and it's so amazing to me. Look at this picture. Don't you just love this picture? The hearts going up into the hand of the king. And the umbrella on the side says resistance is futile. It is. It's, the resistance is futile when you truly encounter the love of Yeshua. Luke 7 relates the story of a sinful woman who anoints Yeshua's feet. This was not Mary of Bethany the one I mentioned earlier, but it was rather it was another woman, an unnamed woman. Many were disturbed by what she did. This woman came in, Yeshua was eating at the house of Simon the Pharisee, and she came and she was a sinner, and she wanted to receive forgiveness for him. She, her heart was moved. She knew he was the Messiah. And she came and she poured out the alabaster jar on his feet, and she, she wept on his feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair. And Yeshua's words teach us an important lesson, an important lesson about the woman that served him and that followed him around. He said, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as great as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. The woman who followed Yeshua knew this deeply. In Luke 8, we know that it says that Yeshua had healed them from many diseases. He had also cast out demons. For Miriam of Magdala alone, seven demons had been expelled. These women knew what it meant to live ruined lives. They knew what it meant to be wealthy women because they were. All of the three that we're going to look at now, they were wealthy. They were women of substance and stature in society's eyes, but they were ruined women. They had, They were 
you know, having demons inside of them. They had diseases. We don't know what kind of diseases, but Yeshua touched them and he healed them. And that exemplified the scripture and it touches my heart so deeply. It says, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. I know, truthfully, I want to say this. I know many men and, and women who have had Damascus experiences with their father, with the father and the truth that what I mean by Damascus experience Paul had a Damascus experience where he li- he heard the voice of Yeshua he literally fell off his horse and he went blind his life was forever changed and the truth of the matter is many people who have been drug addicts who have been homeless who have lived on the street many people who may have aborted their children who were involved in things that were that we consider even in society as truly bad when they meet Yeshua they have a Damascus experience with him and their lives are never the same they love a lot because they know that they've been forgiven a lot and that is the absolute truth you know that song amazing grace it's an it's a hymn that I love so much and the man that wrote that used to be used to own a slave ship he owned a slave ship and he he captained that ship for many many years and he had in his logbooks 20,000 slaves that he had sold over time. He himself did not sell them, obviously, but he was doing the work of those who were slave traders. And he, when he had a conversion experience, a Damascus experience with Yeshua, he wrote that song called Amazing Grace because he realized how much Yeshua had forgiven of him. And the truth of the matter is, he who has been forgiven little loves little. It doesn't matter about how big your sins are, but what matters is how you real, how much you realize how much of a sinner you actually are. And I remember the day that I got saved. I saw myself how I truly was, and my heart was broken because I realized just how death had clung to me. And that's the absolute truth. These women who followed Yeshua, they knew this truth. They knew that they had been oppressed by demons. They knew that they were that they had ill health and bad diseases. And Yeshua, he touched them and he healed them all. And because of the great love that he showed them, they showed him such great love. Because they, just like the picture behind this, they poured out their heart to the Messiah. They knew, they experienced his love and they knew it. And that is why they wanted to give everything for him. So I want to talk about who these women were. The first we're going to look at is Miriam of Magdala because she's mentioned first. She's mentioned first a number of times. Throughout the Gospels, there are seven Miriams or seven Marys that are mentioned. Okay, so to show us which one is being referred to, Miriam is known as Miriam of Magdala. Magdala was a village situated on the shore of the Galilee. The Talmud calls Magdala by its Aramaic name, Migdal Nunaya. This name literally means the Tower of Fish. The Greek language referred to Magdala as Taricheo, which means salting or the processing of fish. This also shows us that the town of Magdala was a fishing town and it was renowned for its skill in fish processing. But if we also look at the Talmud, which is the Jewish oral law, which was written down eventually, the Talmud also refers to Magdala as a town where boats were built and where there was incredible wealth, but there was a lot of moral depravity. So is true today about the wealthy cities and towns that are exist today. The more wealth people have, the more bored they often are, and the more depravity they can get themselves into if they're not truly saved and seeking the purpose of Yahweh for their life. So she came from a town that was a fishing town, but there was a very wealthy town, and there was a lot of moral depravity. The town was destroyed in AD 66 by the Romans when there was the revolt against Rome, when the Jews rose up against Rome. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, records that 6,500 Jews were slaughtered in the attack on Magdala, and the city itself was destroyed. So we know Miriam of Magdala is mentioned She's mentioned first whenever these female disciples of Yeshua occur. So many say that because she was mentioned first, she was probably the leader. But we can't really say that, but we do know that she is prominent. We do know that she was a woman of whom Yeshua cast out several demons. But you know what she was not? And this is the next thing we're going to get into. She was not a prostitute. Our image of Miriam of Magdala was handed to us by Pope Gregory. Pope Gregory rose to papal power in 590 AD. 
During his time as Pope, he would often offer his own interpretation on certain scriptures during his personal sermons. So how's that for writing into scripture what you think should be there? In one particular sermon, he implicated Mary Magdalene as Luke's anonymous sinner with the alabaster jar found in Luke 7. 36 to 50. I mentioned this woman just now. I mentioned that it was not Mary of Bethany, but it was not Miriam of Magdala either. We cannot say who the woman was in Luke 7. And she definitely wasn't Miriam of Magdala because we know that Miriam was, was not just simply said your sins have been forgiven, but Yeshua had cast out seven demons from her. Like we said already, she was healed. She, it, it, was, it was a Damascus experience for her. So she was not a prostitute. And if I've seen so many art pictures, so many things that just say that. We even have movies that depict this. It is not the truth. And how old is our thinking? Because it was Pope Gregory who rose up in 590. This guy taught his own interpretation and he implicated poor Miriam of Magdala with the sinner and said she was a prostitute. How terrible. She became one of the, the foremost disciples of Yeshua in her day and yet we keep on thinking of her in a wrong perception. So I, I'm really praying that if you get anything out of this that perhaps you'll get this right she was not a prostitute but she was a woman that was caught up like many people are in the sin of this world in the wickedness of this world and Yeshua saved her life for us as diligent seekers of Yahweh's truth our image of Miriam Magdala needs changing as well the four gospels go on to tell us that it was Miriam herself who first discovered Yeshua's empty tomb and it was her along with Yeshua's mother and many other women who followed Yeshua as I said she stayed by the stake of Yeshua when he was dying. Many refer to Miriam Magdala as the apostle to the apostles and I love that. As Yeshua commissioned her in John twenty seventeen to go and tell his followers that Yeshua was indeed alive. He wanted her to go and tell he said, Go and tell them what you have seen. Go and tell them that I am alive. And the truth of the matter is I I spoke about this word apostle in our previous teaching again one can doesn't mean that you are an, in the office of the apostle but you can be on an apostolic mission that is what Yeshua commissioned her to do to go that is an apostolic mission go and tell what you have seen and Miriam was the first one to experience the resurrected Yeshua and she calls him Rabboni Rabboni when she sees him in John 20 which means my rabbi my rabbi she was truly a faithful disciple of the king she began to model his image and he loved her he loved each and every single one of his disciples and he called these women into that intimate space he called them into that place of being a true disciple they walked and they talked and they revealed his image to a dying and broken world Miriam was one of the women who did that and it was it was amazing she came from a wealthy town which also means brethren that she was a wealthy woman of means because we know she ministered and provided she was not a prostitute she was a wealthy woman that was caught up in the wicked ways of the world and how, how many do we know like that i pray for them that they will become a miriam magdala in our day the next woman that's mentioned in luke chapter 8 is a woman named noch johanna or joanna in english she was a married woman she was married to an officer in the household of king herod and she was likewise a woman of means she was a wealthy woman of course interestingly enough she was married but she was at liberty to follow her master and rabbi around this means that her husband Husa supported her decision to do just that and i want to say how far have we fallen from this today Johanna was a woman that she was married she was wealthy but she had met the king and she was saved and she followed him wherever she went and her husband supported her decision some some scholars say that they believe that Chutza lost his position in Herod's household because of his wife but he later became a follower of Yeshua himself whether that is true or not we don't know but what we do know is that he allowed her to follow or he supported her we don't know if she, how headstrong she was, but it wasn't wrong what she did. It was right what she did. She followed the lamb wherever the lamb went, and she provided for him from her own means. And that's just amazing. How far have we fallen from this today? I've heard many women give excuses. I can't do this for, for God because my husband says no. I can't do this for God because my husband doesn't want to go. I can't go to all these meetings. I can't go to the congregation. I can't go to worship because my husband says no. 
that is not the way that the Father wants us to live. He wants us to do what Messiah says we should do. All you need to do in your life, sister, is what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And sometimes it's going to get hard. Sometimes it will be hard. We don't know how hard it was for her husband. We don't know those things. But what we do know is if Yahweh says we need to do it, then we need to do it. That is the basic bottom line. This is not about you trying to rise up and do things that you're not called to do. No, you do what you're called to do. You do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And walk closely with the king so that you can get his dust on you. Because that's what Johanna did. She was a married woman but she followed the lamb. And it's a beautiful thing. The next woman that we're going to look at that's mentioned in Luke 8 is a woman called Shoshana. Which means Lily. It, she's not identified with her husband. So it's assumed that she was not married. And she too was at liberty. She, uh, again we have a wealthy woman here. She followed Yeshua and she provided for him in the twelve. That's what Luke says. She was one of the women who announced the good news of Yeshua's resurrection in Luke 24. It was not only Miriam of Magdala who went back to the tomb. But some of these women had followed Miriam and had gone with her. And she was one of the women who announced the good news because we know that when Yeshua appears to the two men that are walking on the road to Emmaus that we read many times about, they tell him, some of our women have amazed us by saying that the man we know as Yeshua, the man that we thought was the Messiah, they have said that he is resurrected. And so these women announced the good news. This again reminds me of Psalm 68 verse 11. It says, Yahweh sent forth his word, and great is the army of women who announced the good news. This is what we should be doing. We should be announcing the good news of Yeshua's death, his resurrection, and his life to the entire world. And that's what these brave women did. Shoshana was one of them who announced this good news. And it was amazing what they actually did. We're not going to go into the other, that says that there are other women like Salome that were with. But I just wanted us to focus on these three specific women and to think, where do we fall in here? Are we like Shoshana? We're not married? Are, we, are you single? And are you at liberty to provide for those you sure want you to fight for? Are you at liberty to follow the lamb wherever he goes? Are you like Miriam of Magdala who was healed from such wickedness of sin? Are you like maybe Johanna who is married and whose husband is supporting you? Then I want to encourage you. Where do you fall in? And what example can you take from their lives? And what example can you set for the generation around you and for the generations to come after you? Because that's what we need to ask ourselves. There were many, many women known as disciples of Yeshua. And that's amazing. And this is what I want to say. The life of a disciple is one of character change. It's not only about does the disciple, what does the disciple know. It's not about that. It's about how deep is the disciple's desire to learn from his or her rabbi. How deep is your desire to learn what Yeshua wants for your life. You know, many things are mentioned in the Word. We need to love the Word of Yahweh. We need to love the Torah. We need to embrace the entire Word of God from Genesis through to Revelation. But also, deeper still, what we need to embrace is, what is the living Word that Yeshua has given you for your life in this time? Because what you need to specifically do for your life is not specifically laid out in the Word. The Word doesn't specifically say, Aliyah, you need to teach this today. It doesn't say that, but through a living relationship with the King, I can hear what Messiah wants me to do today. So that's what a disciple, a true disciple wants to know. What is it that you want from me today, Yeshua? You are my rabbi. What is it you want from me today? When you go to work in the morning, when you get dressed in the morning and you jump out of bed and you say, yes, I'm alive in today, do you sit and go, Father, what is it that you want from me today? I know that many of you do that. I know that many of you sit and say, Yeshua, what is it you want me to do today? I knew a lady a few years ago, she used to jump out of bed and she would say, Father, you don't allow me to come home until I've done what you wanted me to do out there today. And the truth is we need to say, Father, what is it you want me to do today? Because the life of a disciple is one of inward change. It's one of character change. It's not only does the disciple desire to learn from the rabbi, but you desire to learn the rabbi's character so that you can be transformed into the image of that rabbi. That's the goal 
and the aim of what we should be doing. We should be transformed into the image of Yeshua for this dying world. Yeshua did not only have 12 male disciples, but he had a large following of female disciples. This group is identified throughout the Gospels and throughout the book of Acts as the group of women who followed Yeshua. They followed him wherever he went. And in the teaching Yeshua's Talmudot that I mentioned to you earlier, there is a word for follow that is used. In Luke 23, 49, when Yeshua was on the stake, it says all the acquaintances of Yeshua and the woman who had followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance and watched these things. The word for follow that Luke uses to speak about these disciples is a very, very interesting word. It is only used once throughout the entire scriptures. It is a word made up of two Greek words, akoluotheo and son. The former word akolithio means one who accompanies someone, especially as a disciple, or to become a disciple of someone, or to follow a rabbi, or to become the disciple of someone regarding their faith and practice, to follow the teachings of a rabbi. The word son means that you resemble somebody, you resemble your rabbi, you are a companion, and it means that you have a close connection or you have made something complete in your association with them. So in other words, the woman who followed Yeshua, as it says throughout the Gospels and, and Acts, when it refers to the woman who followed Yeshua, in other words, what they did was they were true disciples who were considered his companions they were in his inner circle of followers and they were completely disciples they literally followed the footsteps of their rabbi seeking to conform to his image and to having their character change the truth of the matter is you cannot be delivered from these demons coming out of you and not have a character character change if you do not have a character change then you will just be worse off than you were before these women had a character change and they followed him. They were close companions with him and he knew them. How amazing is that? I marvel at the examples of the female disciples of Yeshua that we find in the gospel stories. Most of them left the luxuries they had been acquainted to in order to live a life of service to the king. They risked ridicule, trust me. When Mary of Bethany, who was also a disciple of Yeshua, but falls outside of this teaching when she anointed Yeshua for his death she was ridiculed she was ridiculed but they risked ridicule they risked death they risked grief and pain because in plain they lay down their lives to serve Yeshua and I asked myself many times would I have done the same would we do the same today will we do the same what have we done to lay down our lives for Messiah Yeshua how have we become his disciples how dusty are we for him they defied the mindset of their day. Are we prepared to defy ours? And I think that that's a really big question that we need to ask ourselves. Many people still want to be blockaded by the mindset of our day, but they weren't blockaded by the mindset of theirs. I'm not prepared to be blockaded by mine. I want to do what the Holy Spirit tells me, what Yeshua tells me to do. Will we defy the mindset of our day? And I want to read this scripture to you because it says, Romans 8, 14 to 17 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. By Him we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirits that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share any sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory the truth of this matter is that we are children of the most high god but in order to be called a child you've got to enter first in to being a servant you have to first be a servant you have to be a disciple you are not automatically a child you have to learn how to serve yeshua's disciples when they were with him they first served him and then he said i no longer call you servants i call you friends because they had learned how to serve him and the truth is that when we have the Spirit of God Himself within us and we learn to serve Him and we learn to be His disciple, then we are truly children of God. We no longer have to fear, but we live in the Father's house and we can enjoy being a child. We can know that no matter what happens in our life, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And I want to just share a story with you that just really, really touched my heart and really, really brings this point home. 
on your screen you'll see a beautiful picture of Sherry. Sherry is a seven-year-old female sausage dog and about two weeks ago my parents said to us that they are considering adopting another sausage dog and this was quite something because my parents never really liked small dogs but they already have two sausage dogs and these two sausage dogs just love living with my parents it's like a pet palace in that house they get chicken and they get a warm fire and they sleep in the bed and they just love it and what happened was a man phoned up my father and he said that they have this seven-year-old sausage dog that they need to get rid of and this for me is always sad because people don't take older dogs in the latter half of their life they want dogs that are puppies still and the truth is that this little sausage dog was just left outside with other dogs these other dogs were taking this dog's food but no one was actually really watching what was happening and they just they just wanted to get rid of her they said no they couldn't have her anymore and my parents hearts were quite moved and they went to go and meet the sausage dog and the guy did a very clever thing when my father walked in the door he just put this dog into my father's arms and this dog just took to my father and that was it so sherry went home with them and she met the other two sausage dogs and after an initial greeting they got along quite well and then my mother told me that they took sherry to their bed and they put her on the bed because my parents dogs sleep in the bed and sherry just went stiff she just froze she couldn't even imagine that there was this velvety blanket beneath her feet she couldn't she couldn't just handle this and she sat there for half an hour really confused and then my father took her and he put her on the pillow this was her the in the picture on the pillow put the blanket up over her and now she's found her sleeping spot for life my mom says this is where she sleeps in the night and after that they gave her her chicken with rice and Himalayan rock salt and this is how they eat and initially Sherry was stealing the other dog's food because she didn't realize that the people that loved her and the people that had taken her into their home was going to give her enough food they, they were going to give her her daily bread and Sherry's story has really spoken to me because we met her the other day and when she came into my parents house she was so thin you could feel her spine you could feel her ribs she she was not really very well looked after even though the people that had her didn't intentionally leave it like that it just was something that happened and and I just honor what my parents did for her because she is just an amazing dog and she's just settled in and she's put on a bit of weight and she's gonna have a great life but it really, really spoke to me about what Father does for us in our lives and what he did in Romans 8 for us. You know, he took us from being out there in the world, out there where when you're out in the world, you basically are out in, in, in that place where you don't have spiritual food. You are thin. You are anemic. You don't have anything. You sleep outside. You're cold. The world is a destitute place. You have a ruined, broken life. And when we become a true child of the king, he takes you into his house and he gives you this bed that you don't even know anything about. You're like, Sherry, you're frozen. And you're thinking, what? There's a velvety blanket and I'm sleeping on a pillow. You're not used to this. We're not used to the love and the mercy. We're not used to the compassion. We're not even used to the freedom. Because Romans 8 says that we're no longer slaves you know, our chains are gone, like it says in that song. We have been set free. And we, like Sherry, we need to get used to the freedom that Messiah Yeshua has purchased us. That freedom doesn't give us liberty to sin. That freedom means we live in the Father's house and that we can become His children and that He will give us our daily bread. We're not used to having enough to eat. We're not used to being spiritually fed. But when we become true children, we follow our rabbi wherever he goes. We eat of His word every day. We eat of His spirit and His truth every day. We are so satisfied that we begin to put on spiritual weight spiritual weight that we need instead of being anemic and thin and that's what I want to say to you today that you are called to be a disciple a disciple is not a follower it is easy for someone to put their hand up and get saved and confess Messiah Yeshua but what matters is the life you live after you've put your hand up and you got saved what matters is the path that you walk and how closely you follow the rabbi how closely you walk with him each and every single day. How much of your time do you spend with him? How do you practice the art of living in his presence 24-7? Because we can. We can live in his presence 24-7. 
We just need to become holy. We just need to fall in love with him. We just need to entertain his presence and love him, but also to be loved by him. Sometimes people find it easy to love the Father, but to be loved by him is something that they struggle with. And that was what Sherry needed to learn in her own life, that she could be loved and that she could be provided for in such a special way. This is truly, there's a saying that I love, it says the enemy wants to get us to think that we are paupers when we are actually princesses. We are not paupers, we are not begging on the side of the road, we are princesses, but we have to not sport a title, we need to live up to the mandate that we have been given. Only when you enter into the inheritance covenant of God, when you have truly become a servant and then a friend and then a child, can you put the crown on your head and get your inheritance. And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I refer to the covenants, I want to ask you to go go and look at some of the teachings. Some of the teachings that my husband has done on the covenants. The covenants are so close to our heart. And in this generation and in this season of time in Yahweh's time calendar he's speaking to us about the inheritance covenant this is what he is saying the true revealing of the sons and daughters of Elohim is going to take place and the when it takes place we receive the crown and we receive all that he has for us and I want to ask you today have you become a servant of the king? Have you become someone that walks in the dust of your rabbi? Have you become someone that is laying your life down for his life? Have you become someone that is walking so close to him? You know, there is time, but time is running out. And it's time for you to decide how close you want to be with him. We should be called disciples of the Most High God. We should be called Talmidim and Talmidot. We should be called those things. We cannot live a worldly lifestyle and think that we are going to suddenly be these children of God. We need to reveal the image of our Maker and our Master to the dying and broken world around us. So I just want to say that these women, they did amazing things. Yeshua said in Matthew 28, he said, go and make disciples of all all the nations he did not discriminate he didn't say only go to the men and make them disciples he said no you go to all the disciples you go to all of them in all the nations of the world in every generation and you make true and proper disciples of them this is something that uh, that sadly to say much of the Christianity has failed to do in making true disciples, true men and women who reflect the image of Messiah Yeshua to this dying and broken world. We don't want to be followers anymore. We don't just want to be people that have put up our hand and have said, yes, we confess Yeshua, but live a different life. We want to be disciples, people that reveal the image of our maker. And yes, we will make mistakes for the word also says that all fall short and we all sin. But the truth is that a lifestyle of repentance is needed and also that when you sin you get up and you repent and you keep going we keep going and we keep going and we know that his love it just fills our hearts and so I want to say woman you are boldly called and you have a great 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 calling on your life a great purpose take from these examples of the woman that followed Yeshua they were companions of the king they knew him and they walked with him and you can do the same start seeing yourself as a true disciple and allow this king of kings to mold and to change you daily as you walked with him for again I want to end off with the same scripture that I ended off in our last teaching it's in Joel 2 it says I will pour out my flesh upon my spirit sorry upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy your old men will dream dreams your young men will see visions upon my male servants and upon my female servants in those days will I pour out my spirit this is his promise and this is what he will do let us pray father we just want to thank you so much that your word has so much truth in it that father we need to dig so deep sometimes father we can dig into it's like a treasure chest father and we thank you for these nuggets of treasures that you give into our hands father there were so many women that followed you there were so many women that are following you and we are thankful father we are thankful that we can follow you with everything that we have father tonight we come and we lay down our gifts at your feet father use your your gifts that you have given us to glorify your holy name 
Father, I pray for those women that are still thinking about this journey, Father. I pray that they will not be thinking, but that they will be walking, Father. I pray tonight, Father, that you would empower us to do all that you have asked us to do. Give us of your spirit, Father, we pray. Fill us with your spirit. Pour out your spirit upon us so that we, Father, can do the things that you have created us to do. We want to exemplify our Messiah. We want to be the image of our King to this dying generation. Father, we bow our knee to you tonight. We ask that you will come and take control. And Father, we glorify you. Father, we honor you. And we just thank you, Father. We just give you all the praise tonight in Yeshua HaMashiach's mighty name. Amen. Amen. I just want to ask of you, if you want to subscribe, please do subscribe on YouTube. If you want to receive more teachings, these teachings are being such a blessing to us, as well as a blessing to the many people that are receiving them. And that is all that we want. We want to just share the word. We, we share these messages because Yeshua compels us to share these messages with you and we want to ask that if you are blessed that you will subscribe but also that you will consider to share these teachings with your social networks on the, on your youtube if you got a youtube if you got google plus facebook twitter pinterest wherever we don't mind you just take these teachings and allow yahweh's word just to minister to people because that's all in this dying generation we want to make disciples of all nations leading them to the king of kings messiah yeshua himself it's not about anybody it's not about any of us it's all about him and i want to ask that if you want to do this that you would do it that you would share it and that you would subscribe and i just pray that you will have a blessed week a week that is just filled with his grace and filled with his love and i pray that it will be a new week a week where you're going to discover something new about your messiah and something new about your own life that you will draw closer to him and closer to who he has called you to be in his kingdom and we just thank you so much for listening and i bless you in yeshua's name mm-hmm.